You know how you always have in your life a little something's missing. You think something's missing. And what it is, I've discovered, is actually a table. A table that is an all-purpose table. You sometimes need a workbench. You sometimes need somewhere to serve drinks at an outdoor party. Ah, huh? How do you like this? It's cedar. It's all put together with zinc screws so that it, you know, it's not going to rust. And it has decorative wood burning on it, which I just learned how to do, and I love doing it, and you're going to learn. So this is, if you've never built a table before, this is the most basic design, the most rudimentary kinds of joints. You don't need any fancy tools. It's going to be cool. <laughs> OK, so first of all, though, you've got you to gotta have the right saw. We're doing basic hand tools here. The right saw is a Japanese-style pull saw. The teeth point toward me, see, when I'm sawing, which means it's going to cut on the pull stroke rather than the push stroke. The old kind of saw, like your dad had, and you probably inherited this kind, totally get rid of it because it really isn't helpful. It will just make you frustrated, and you will be weeping, and you will not have a table. So get this kind of a saw. And what I'm doing here is just squaring up the end. A lot of time when you buy the lumber, it's really not quite square, and it'll be frustrating later when you're trying to put the table together. So you just make a mark. This is a speed square. It'll help you. And then I'm just going to finish sawing this. There we go. Just a little nub. Now, this lumber is actually 1 by 6. It's a full 1 inch. It, it's tricky to find this sometimes. It's pure cedar, and um, it, but it makes a really nice, sturdy apron. You wouldn't want to go any thinner than one inch to make your apron. This is called an apron, or sometimes a skirt, depending on your mood. So the first two boards we need to cut are 46 inches long for the apron, and then the little side pieces are 23 inches long. So let's get going on that. And this is my new recordable tape measure so that I can actually record the measurements into it, because I always forget them. So we'll see if we need that or not. So I go to 46 inches. I make a mark, just one little cute pencil mark. And then that speed square comes, speed swear, I said, comes in handy again, because you just make one mark like that. And now you have your cutting line. So I'll just, just knock something off the bench nicely. So I'll put that here. Now, this helps. If you have some um, leftover carpet underlayment for throw rugs, it stops the board from skidding as you're cutting. So that'll be helpful, because otherwise it walks around. And also, if you have some clamps. If you don't have any clamps, ask for them for special occasions, like wedding anniversaries or the birth of your first child. Because you know, there's nothing more important in life than good clamping. All right, so everything's clamped. I'm ready to go. Don't quite have enough room. So to get the saw started, you actually glide it along on a, in a pushing direction, like that. And then that, oops, and then that gets it started. And off you go. And there's so little effort. See how easy it is? There. See, hear that? Huh? Doesn't that make you feel hot? OK, so there's my first, oh no, this is my first board, my 46-incher. So I have to cut a 23-incher to fit on the end, too. And then, uh, then I'll, I'll start putting my apron together. Two 46s, two, oh, see? Two, see, this is right. Okay, Tin for Roger got that. Is that cool or what? Oh, I'm so proud. Okay, so I'll cut some more boards and then we're ready to assemble the apron. They say that the older you get, the more you realize how little you know. Well, I think what they really mean is the more you realize how much you forget because there's a point where you can't even remember what you've forgotten you once knew or even whether you ever knew it. OK, so if you haven't actually bought your own clamps by now, you're going to really be hungering for them because, look, they hold the whole little rectangle together. And you can even get these really cool corner clamps, which is totally clamp hot dogging, frankly. But what they do is they fit in like this. And so you don't have to, I mean, 
Oh, baby. Okay, so that's another option, okay? You know, the clamping world is just like truly a pleasure. So now that we have that done, I'm gonna drill. And the reason you drill for, before you put the screws in is because the boards are brittle and they'll split and then the table becomes quite rickety. So, let's get that started and then down again here. And I'm just eyeballing, I'm not gonna measure up and be all anal about it. But you can do that if you want, you know, if you want a really precise looking table. I like them kind of rustic. So here's the deal. The screw length is important, okay? You have to choose a screw that will go half way in, like the, the length of the wood that you're using again into the other board. So this is about a two and a half inch screw, all right? And then I'm gonna use a trim uh, washer, which is what this thing is. And it's really cool because it bites into the wood. It's got this nice sharp metal edge and it actually helps suck the boards together. It helps apply a lot more pressure than just a simple screw head, which tends to get wobbly. So I'm just going to put that right there. Okay, at this one I can actually get rid of the clamp. Woo! Because it's impeding my progress. That was ner nerve wracking. The only thing about clamps is they kind of have personalities of their own, so you have to get used to having extra personalities in the workshop. There. Whoa! There I tossed again. Okay. Actually, what we're making here is a seesaw. I just didn't mention it earlier. Okay, so there's that. So what you need to do now is put the top on. And the top, instead of one inch thick boards, I'm gonna go with fencing material, which is a little thinner. They're all cut to 52 inches, and that's too short. <laughs> okay, something went wrong. See, this is why I should have been listening to my little recording because something's not quite right here. 46 inches. Okay. Somewhere along the line. I See how easy this is to do? That's going to make the boneheaded, most ugly table I've ever seen in my life. Because, you know, they need to overhang. There needs to be an overhanging thing. So, um, so I'll be recutting those because they're not quite right. So. So this is why I, often you have to go to the lumber yard a few times with a project, but get, they'll get used to you over there. <sighs> okay, things are going much better now. I have got the decking mostly on, and I'm countersinking now with this special drill bit. It is called a countersink bit, and it carves out a little space just for the head of the screw so that you don't have a smooth surface and then you hit a screw and it's a big bump and that's just not aesthetically pleasing. So I'll flip this and we'll put the screws in place. And it's neat because you space these boards just enough so that you can see down to where the apron is and then you, you screw into that. There we go. Oh. <laughs> you see, I can't actually see through my safety glasses because they've got fingerprints all over them. So. There, I have to focus. Okay, that baby's ready. So now I'm gonna flip this over and attach the legs. And um, also I wanna point out that I put, oh, I put this brace in so that the boards don't bounce too much but I didn't attach the, the boards to the brace because I always think that looks unsightly to have a big row of screws going down the middle of the table. So, but because it's thin lumber, it's a bit of a long span for it and it'll bounce a bit. So that's why that brace is in there. You can just take a, a spare piece of two by four. So for the legs, the legs are 34 inches tall and they really are, they're the right measurement. And they're just gonna sit in like that, all four of them. This is where it gets a bit tricky because you can end up with all the legs going kind of on their own path. They don't always square up really well. So what I'm gonna do is 
apply, um, attach them loosely, and then I'll come back and square them all up with each other. Um, so to start with, you have to pre-drill again and use the long screws, the two-inch ones, and again using the trim washers for extra strength. And you also want to split the, you don't just attach the screws one on top of the other because that'll put too much stress on the grain of the board and if you, you know, if somebody really jumps on the table at some wild party, the board might split. So it's a really good idea to just put them diagonally. So like for example here and here. That ought to be good. If you were really feeling fastidious, you could even put three in. But that might put too much stress on that one that, were, that had the two screws. So let's just leave it at that. And then I'll get all these legs attached, and then we'll do some tweaking. There's a very old saying that nothing is really work unless you'd rather be doing something else. So whenever I feel like I'd rather be doing something else, I do. And that way, when I'm 95, I'll be able to say, I've never worked a day in my life. And everyone in the nursing home will think I'm really rich. OK, we have ourselves a situation here. See, this is why th I said it was tricky. This square is telling me that it's sitting nice and flat on the surface, but this line here is not remotely square. So, And what happened is I didn't clamp as I was screwing this leg in, and so it's gone wonky. So it's really important to clamp the legs while you're screwing them in place. How to adjust this, you got to know, it's a matter of playing with these two screws. This one, the top one, needs to suck the board toward it harder. And you can see there's two screws to holding this leg on, but there's a third one here, which I didn't mention earlier. And it goes in and holds the whole thing. So it's really very stable, but it's crooked. So we'll just undo this a little bit. So I can't get it any tighter without backing it out first. See, now I can start to move the board around a bit. And I'm going to undo the bottom one, too. And see, now I've got the board. Now it, there's some play in it. So I'll clamp it and then screw it together. So I'll put the square on it again to make sure it's, oh, so sweet. When you're just working on all four corners, it's hard to keep track. So, so let's, holding this tightly in place, let's suck that baby in. Oh, no, my clamp's in the way. <laughs> there we go. Mm, that made contact. Okay, still square. Mm, starting to lose it just a little bit. So I'm going to have to suck this baby in hard. Good. Okay, so that's a leg tweak, a, an official leg tweak. And, um, you, you know, you just, the, the squarer they are, the sturdier the bench is going to be, right? So you just want to take care of those little things. So I think I think everything else is good. I'll just, I'll just finish checking the square on all these legs, and then we'll flip it over and uh, get on to wood burning. Oh, I see. This is totally out. It's totally out. Bertrand Russell said that the trouble with the world is that the stupid are cocksure and the intelligent are full of doubt. I've found the happy medium is always assuming that my doubts are stupid while trying to act smarter than I look. Okay, so I've got, you know what, I just felt the easiest way to square these legs, they're giving me a bit of a problem, was to just put these two braces on. That allows me to spread the legs, put this in place, and now everything's all squared up. So that's another option that you have. And it gave me an idea for what to do with those boards that I cut too short earlier. OK, we're talking shelf action here. So I'll just flip this over. And. Uh, There 
we go. Oh, okay, good. And then what I'm going to do is actually take those short boards and lay them across in the middle section to make a shelf because I deserve a shelf. It's in my own shelf interest, really, and it'll improve my shelf image. Okay, so I'll be putting that shelf right there. Look how pretty. I'm so proud of my shelf. Okay, so I'll just screw these. Once I'm done screwing, I'll be in a burning mood, okay? Okay, I just had to take the edges off because I like it. I like everything to be smooth. So everything's smooth now, including the top. And um, this is a, a random orbital sander which spins and actually vacuums the sawdust as you go. They're great. They, they're not as dusty to use as a simple palm sander. Okay, so now I wanted to show you how to do some wood burning. There's two different styles of wood burning. There's a kind of free-handed style and a more traditional style. And this is the most common type of wood burning unit. It, it's um, a little bit thick in the old grip for me. And this one actually has a little pointy tip. You can get all kinds of different tips for them. They're made out of brass, including diamonds and stars that you can special order so you can do a little branding edge all along your project. But all you do is you just drag it across the wood like this, but it tends to get stuck in the grain of cedar, so it's not totally my favorite tip. But it, it's quite serviceable. Only thing is, it's not that hot. It kind of cools off, and it's hard to make the line consistent. So I upgraded recently to this unit, which has two different handsets on it. It heats up in no time at all. This is a, a typical, um, just a, a normal engraving tip. It's very thin, so you can't press too hard, but it really gets hot. And then this is a, a calligraphy tip. So watch, I've turned the power on, and it heats up really, really fast. Like by now, ta -da, it's red hot. Ha, huh, how about that? So now I just, here, to, 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 to work with it, you just look at the smoke. So you just drag it along. If, I, if I'm going too fast, I'll get a finer colored line. If you want a really, really dark line, you have to have it on a top. Um, heat setting. To do the leaves that I, sh that I did over on this one, you make the leaf shape, any leaf shape you want. A lot of people do ivy, but I did this kind of rambling potato vine. <laughs> Don't know why, really. I just see a lot of ivy around, so I went for the potato vine. So there's the leaf, and then you want to draw in the spine of the leaf and the little veins, like this. And then you have to shade it somehow. And the best way is to drag the tip across like this. Oh, this smoke smells so good. This cedar smoke is really great. So see, it's getting a shaded appearance. OK, so that's not looking very good yet. But um, I'll, I'll just keep darkening it till I get a proper leaf looking thing. So. Honestly, I have I spent totally hours under my other table doing this on the legs. And now I'm realizing I should have just stood it up like this, because I was lying on my side on the floor getting cramps in unusual places. Boy, whew. my eyes are watering. OK, so cool, right? Very contemporary, very wing in it style of, of wood burning. However, there are other people, artisans working in a traditional style of wood burning. For example, Yancha Blockhouse Mulder works in New Brunswick. And she has done some amazing um, woodworking projects, including the blue checker set there. That's aniline dye, I think she used to get that blue, beautiful blue. And she's got a little village scene happening there. And by the way, mackerel sky not long dry, I learned that at camp. That means it's going to really dang pour any moment now. It's when the clouds are in sort of strings. So uh, then, then again in the front, she did a keepsake box. And she's from the Netherlands, so she does a lot of the kind of villages and houses you see along the canals. And then also, she has another checkerboard there that has more traditional village scenes. So it's really fun. Like, you just won't believe how fun this is. So 
You can just spend hours. And it smells good. And it's wholesome. The great James Thurber wrote that it is better to know some of the questions than all of the answers. Well, you have to admire his perspective, but when you're doing carpentry, you need answers. So if Thurber were your next door neighbor, you probably wouldn't ask him to help you with carpentry projects. But then when you're done and the thirst is building, just give him two bucks and say, it is better to have some of the money for a six pack than to have to buy all of the beer.